I'm excited and honored to be here uh, at the State Archive. Uh, I normally, when I start these uh, presentations, I ask people about uh, some of their own experiences with the arts, and of course, it's almost since I always speak in St. Louis, almost always speak in St. Louis, it's there are people who just live right down the street from it. Uh, so uh, I'm going to ask some people if they could just uh, share some of their experiences, maybe from a distance of a, hundred, of a couple hours away. Or Anybody have any experiences with the RC like that? Yes? Okay. Um, anybody else? Yeah, I remember uh, going up into the top and having that wonderful view out the corridor until I looked straight down and I realized I was on, you know, leaning out over nothing except for the skin of that thing and uh, that's given me vertigo ever since. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that is. Uh, uh, who else? Yes? Uh, years ago I had the opportunity to uh, perform at the Dale Prophet Fair underneath that arch. Really? Did you go up? Oh, yeah. yeah. That's good. Uh, yes, yes. Um, I uh, grew up in St. Louis, so I watched it being built. Wow. This yeah. gentleman here said I'm not that old, but I am. So um, I was being built. And it was, it hadn't been open very long at all. And um, so my mother, my sister, older sister was on a class trip. And so my mother took the rest of us to the arch. And um, they, she had six children. And um, so she couldn't, we couldn't all go on the same tram. So um, my one of my other sisters and I were in the tram with a with a lady who was really afraid, but she wanted to go up, right. and so she clutched our hands so tightly <laughs> that I thought our hands were going to be broken. But she got up there. She looked out the window once, and then she went back down. Oh wow! Whereas we whereas we kept looking and enjoying, and we actually watched the uh, parade, the parade um, that was dedicated to the Cervantes Convention Center. Wow, that's neat. Okay. Hey, yes. I was in uh, college at Urbana, okay. and uh, a lot of associates were in architectural or engineering school. And so it was a common topic about the arts, and post dispatch, as I recall, put okay. out quite a few photographs in their Sunday post dispatch. So we got that in Champaign Urbana and went over all the photos. And yes, it was uh, a lot of talk about it in college, because it was. Uh, such an engineer, and if I look back, it's even uh, more dramatic. Well, I have some, I was mentioning to my friend Chuck here, uh, uh, who's also an engineer, uh, engineers and architects and math geeks, uh, they, ex they get more excited about it than anybody. I'll take one more. Yes, yes ma'am. When I was in the eighth grade in a small school um, in Union, Missouri, which is just outside of St. Louis, sure. there was a picture of the arch that was going to be in, that was quote, in St. Louis. And we had relatives in the city and were downtown shopping all the time as a kid with my family. And I never could find it. And it wasn't until later when we lived in Jennings, North St. Louis, that we watched it going up. Oh, well, that's, um, that is fantastic. At that so, time, they were clearing, yeah. well, my, clearing the area for the, the arch grounds. OK, um, well, my experience is a little bit more. And, First of all, I'm going to give you a little, little peek of where I'm going to be going with this. Uh, the Gateway Arch was, uh, things like that do not happen unless you have the larger than life people involved. And there are many larger than life people with stories and not, not always good, which makes it always fun. Um, but what they did was, they created a, a monument that is absolutely the best thing that St. Louis has. And uh, maybe that's blowing my, my horn, but I really think it is, and it's going to be there a thousand years from now. But uh, anyway, the, uh, uh, like I said, I was 11 years old when the Gateway Arch, uh, when they started putting in the first piece of oak ground, for the Gateway Arch. I was 14 years old when it was finished on October 28th, 1965. This, my dad often would throw us into his big caddy and he'd take us downtown and we'd see just 
it getting up and you know when I first started there was a, just a tiny little bit we'd look up over there and then a little bit more and a higher 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 and we heard the joke about it being uh, you know a uh, a big wicket you know uh, you know they're gonna they're going to make another one across the river and they're gonna you know have uh, so uh, and the ones about it going to whether it's gonna meet. But I got excited about it when I was able to go up there. I, I just loved looking out. And uh, I, was, I moved away in 75 and didn't move back until, uh, until 91. And every time I came home, I saw this. I saw the Gateway Arch. And I, and I was home. And uh, I kind of, kind of, you know, being right next to it, I got a little bit cold. And then I started writing books, and I talked to my editor about maybe writing something about the Gateway Arch. Uh, and he was excited, and I wrote, I did it, and I spent time in the archive and time just studying it, just looking at it, staring at it, staring at it, till, no lie, you would see, look, this way, the arch is like, like this way, and then all of a sudden, you'd see this way. Uh, and then it would kind of flip in your mind, and I knew it wasn't, but, uh, and so, and then we got out of first edition in, uh, in, in 14, and was it 15? 14, and then we got another one out uh, last year, and I got so excited, and uh, so, again, about the, the, and so that's me. Uh, maybe I'm just a little local guy and I'm seeing it from that way, but I don't think so. I think we've got something amazingly special, which I'm going to try to talk to you about. Uh, right here. Uh, you, if you're ever there, uh, have fun with your camera, take it from different angles. Uh, this right here, oh my goodness, so uh, uh, um, And right here. This talks about, uh, if you'll see up there at the top, there was a uh, parking lot. That's the way it was designed. See the parking lot above and over? Uh, just uh, that what right there is a sort of like one of the reasons why they did a $380 million uh, renovation on the, on this is because people would park, people from out of town would just park in that parking lot. And then they would um, go in right here. This is, they would just line up in a long line and uh, it's really nice on a day in August when you're out waiting to get in for 30 minutes or 35 minutes and it's 90 degrees out. Um, but then they would do this and then they would come right out and they would get on that parking lot and they'd leave and they would never see anything else in St. Louis. And the civic leader said, no, there's, you know, we got we got there's lots of things that need to be updated uh, around the arch, not the arch itself, though, the arch is fine, uh, have to be updated around the arch and uh, so they fixed it, so again, they got rid of that parking lot and made it so you had to park downtown. And pretty sneaky there. Now it's fine, they say you always have parking, except on days, sun, on days when the Cardinals park during the day, which is about half the weekends. So my advice to you is if you want to come, if you want to have it easy, come on a Sunday, uh, should be a Sunday, that there is no cardinal gate. You will be able to park on the street without any parking. Uh, and then you'll be able to go up and you'll you know, stay as long as you want. It's beautiful, it's wonderful. Uh, the only problem is, it seems to me most people from Jefferson City, when they come in uh, to St. Louis, 
They come and they want to see a cardinal game, don't they? Or many people do. But anyway, uh, it's definitely better uh, right here again. Uh, this right here, this is called the park over the highway, right here. You see right here, there's, there's the highway, and here's the park, and those little dots are people. Um, and so they, people go in there. Uh, it, that wasn't there. You could walk through, but it was a lot less convenient. It's beautiful, and you see right here, this is inside the uh, waiting area. I mean, to go inside, uh, you still might have to wait to go through security, but at least it's inside where it's air conditioned and you need that in St. Louis. Uh, and so, but it's so beautiful. Uh, right here, there's another view. And right here, this is a rebuilt version of the Missouri Fur Company Fur Trading Post that was built in 1818 and it was a victim of the construction of the Gateway Arch. Uh, and uh, they have about six different sections of the, mu of the new museum, which are better because of technology. You can see these screens, these interactive screens, and also because they don't only look at something from the viewpoint of the uh, Americans. Good Americans going west, they, they <coughs> take pictures all kinds of people, how it affects people, uh, and it's a, and also the old thing, well it was, it was basically, it was old, it was, if you had, a, if you had a uh, living room that was put together in 1976 and hadn't been changed, you might want to update it a little bit, and so they did. Uh, and so they did some outside things. This right here is uh, the St. Louis Riverfront in the eight, 1850s. And of course, the, as we'll see, the whole theme, the reason why the arch was, begin, was built in the first place was just to emphasize, to honor Jefferson and the travel way uh, and the what the going west from the wilderness from St. Louis. Uh, and uh, St. Louis, the, the gateway arch is called the gateway to the west. Uh, so uh, another thing, uh, well, that's the same scene we saw before. Uh, of course, this, uh, this is one of the views, of course, this, this is from the, the top of the arch. This is one of the views going west. Uh, actually, if you ever go to the they, they want to go on July 4th for their, their big um, fireworks display. You want to go, uh, you might consider going on the east side, that over there, that's the, uh, that is uh, the casino, the queen, that, the other one over to the right, that is uh, a park that they made, uh, that uh, it's a great view and not that many people go. Uh, now, this is, once we've said this, how did it get started? Luther Ely Smith. This was the guy who got things started. Actually, what happened was um, the, the uh, St. Louis was obviously founded as a river town. Everything that was, everything that people had was brought in from the river. So it was uh, um, the area around the river was obviously very vibrant from the beginning, <laughs> including right here, this one, the river the river days, uh, and but all of a sudden, this the East Bridge. People remember, people are familiar with this. 1874, wonderful thing, but it made St. Louis a railroad town, and so 
people started moving in and they, the people, there was no need necessarily for people to be down on the riverfront and people started moving west and it became an eyesore and for one of the biggest cities in the country that uh, would do when starting in the 1880s, they thought, what are we going to do? What are we going to do with the, with the uh, downtown riverfront? And so what they did, they talked about maybe some kind of park, like the parks along the rivers in Europe, uh, all kinds of different things. But uh, basically it just sat there. Um, this right here is St. Louis, I guess, in the 18th, this is around where the arch was, is now. St. Louis, where the, uh, when they built the arch, uh, much, much longer before they built the arch. Uh, then, uh, and again, they didn't know what to do with it. This was, be, this, I think this was taken before the Depression. Uh, then, and here is a model, uh, 1928, of what one possible things they could have done. Then, again, Luther Ely Smith. He was a good guy. He was a Republican, but he got, away, he got along with everybody. He, uh, everything that happened in the, er, he was a lawyer, a do-gooder lawyer and civic leader. And uh, he was involved in the farming formation of the Muni Opera and, uh, and the playgrounds. And of course, this was, playgrounds were a big deal because Kids would, kids would play, but back then the poor kids, they might not play in, a, in very safe areas. Uh, everything. And so he, uh, he was thinking about this, and there was a uh, sort of a national memorial that he got involved in. Uh, he, was, he knew uh, Calvin Coolidge, and he was appointed to this national to this thing to form a national memorial in Vincennes, Indiana, and he thought, we could do the same thing. This was 1933, and he came up with the idea of a national uh, memorial to Jefferson and to the, um, uh, the, the move west. And, and he really had some vision there, but he also wanted to put together uh, find a way to, to employ 5,000 people. And he want, so he wanted to get $30 million, which is big money in the 1930s. And he talked to the mayor, which who was a Democrat, as of course is a Republican, uh, by the name of uh, Dickman, Bernard Dickman. And he was a, uh, this is another view of the, uh, of that area at the time. Uh, that was again, remember we had that old building from the 19, uh, 18, 18, uh, this was actually the real building uh, that they had in the museum. They, uh, he had, so, uh, they, the mayor got really excited, and when you, you got Bernard Dickman excited, you, there was nothing stopping you. Uh, they talked to the federal government, and the federal government said, yeah, that sounds pretty good, but uh, you need some skin in the game. They had, uh, they wanted the city to come up with seven and a half million dollars, and then the the feds, the feds had come up with twenty-two and a half million dollars, which was thir which was seventy-five twenty-five. Uh, but it's a common practice today, even. Uh, so they they came to city uh, citizens in St. Louis, and they said, "Let's." Uh, oops. Oops. Oh. Oh. Let's see. They said, "Let's." Um, no. Well, that's a little bit ahead. Let's just hold up. They said, if we do this, we will have 5,000 people working for years. And so, and they, uh, Bernard Dickman also 
spoke to the employees of the city when the reporters were around saying, I want to know the names of anybody who is in my army on this. And so they went out and they won. And they thought that they would get the money within a couple of weeks, and they didn't have it. It didn't come, and this was in the fall of 35, and it, they didn't come, they didn't come, and so they went up, they went to St. Louis, I mean, they went up to uh, Washington, and they started banging on doors, and the president promised, this was in the newspaper, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, in a morning in November, we will sign something this afternoon, but first I'm gonna throw the piece of paper over to Homer Cummings, the, uh, the Attorney General. And Homer Cummings came up with a, uh, he, he looked at it and says, you can't do that. You can't give them that money. You're, you're, you are promising money based, you know, you can't obligate future Congresses. And so that was that, they went home. But Bernard Dickman stood, uh, he just stood and stood. He wasn't going to have that. So he came up and he said, and this is according to the Globe Democrat after the arch was built. He said that to him. He said this and nobody was disputing it. It sounded like him. If we don't get our gateway, if we don't get our money, we are going to. I am going to make sure that Roosevelt loses in 36 in Missouri if I have to campaign against him myself. And so I said, oh, I, I can't do that. I can't do that. But shortly after that, he learned that sure enough, they came up with money from the, uh, from uh, this bill, this law, this the 1935 law that was meant to uh, meant to protect uh, historic buildings. So uh, they got the money. They got part of the money. They got enough money just to just acquire the land through eminent domain and tear it down. Not enough for uh, not enough for the rest of the stuff, so they never got 5,000 people working. But they, they did. Here's what happened right here. They cleared it, 37 acres. I'm, not, I'm sorry, 37 blocks. And you know, you know what? Again, uh, and a lot of it was chunky, but there, if anybody know of Lafayette Square or Sulawarn, Okay, Sloppia Square, they said the same thing about Sular. And you look at Sloppia Square and Sular, that's a pretty nice area. But anyway, they cleared this off. And the other thing was the, the bill that they used to get this money was called the Historic Sites Act of 1935. It, one of the things they wanted to do was they wanted to save historic buildings. Uh, anybody see any historic buildings that are saved there? Um, uh, and, 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 uh, there's one other thing. The, uh, there was a building, well, uh, you remember that election they got? Um, it turned out exactly, exactly, almost exactly a year after this. The Post Dispatch, St. Louis Post Dispatch, came up with a uh, huge screaming headline saying that there had been massive fraud in that election, that bond issue election, that they absolutely had to have to get this going. And the Post Dispatch uh, editorialized Are we going to have a monument to one of America's greatest statesmen on the basis of electoral fraud. Now, who here? Who here wants to raise their hand and say they should have stopped right there? Anybody? Anybody? Well, apparently the post dispatch didn't either because it 
It kept going, and so beginning of the they they had it. But here's the here's the neat, neat idea: if Homer Cummings had caved at the beginning. They would have had a lot of junky, uh, the amount of junky uh, 1937 era statues and buildings filling that 37 blocks. And it would have kept the, uh, kept those 5,000 people busy for years, but nobody would have been coming. Nobody would be coming from overseas to see it. So anyway. You had this, you had just a, uh, a blank tablet, something that an artist could, uh, could look at. And that was the beginning of the world of World War II. And nothing was done anything on anything. Uh, except, except that Luther Ely Smith kept his vision alive. And he had a vision for a competition that would get the absolutely most brilliant person. Somebody who was busting out and who had ideas and was ready just to, who would do it, who would have something, maybe do something in Los Angeles or Seattle or Boston. He wanted to be here right on the riverfront. So he, that was his idea, and after the war had ended, he started put his plans. Here, well, here's another view of that. Uh, uh, so, uh, 1947, September 1947, 100 and, uh, 172 ideas were brought forth. So, more monstrosities. Like this thing, this huge bridge uh, going across. Uh, some of them were, it seemed like some guy had an afternoon to kill and he came up with something, you know, like, here, we'll put this building, we'll put this museum here, we'll put this museum here, and something tall, uh, we're done. Uh, but here is another one, you see, there's something tall. That's cool. Uh, but, I mean, and, this right here, uh, remember this, we'll come back. Uh, but there was this guy, Erosarnan, the one of the greatest architects of the 20th century. You mark that. Um, he, was 40, he was 37 at the time. He had, uh, he had spent his, uh, Weekends, I mean, he'd spent the war in Washington thinking about different ideas, uh, and he was under the thumb of his father. I mean, it wasn't a bad thing. His father right there, Elio, who had come over from Finland, and he was known by himself as a great artist. Uh, I mean, as a great, uh, these guys are known. Uh, and this was what he came up with. This was his final design. Uh, and interestingly, both him and his father, uh, they were part, they were, he worked with his, for his father at their architectural firm outside of Detroit. And they both, um, uh, they basically put a little wall in the middle of their office and Elio worked on one side and uh, Aero worked on another. So, uh, but since, uh, I guess it was since he was known. Uh, there was two halves of this. There was the, uh, there was the preliminaries and then they named five finalists to go back, fine tune your ideas and come back. Uh, when it was all over, uh, Elio got a little thing from uh, there's different stories. Elio got something saying, you are a finalist. And so, according to the story, everybody went out and they had, uh, all, everybody, including Errol, they had champagne and they celebrated it. And then somebody very embarrassingly came up and says, uh, 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 I'm uh, sorry, uh, Mr. 
Ely was smiling. It's your son. And then they had more champagne, because it was all in the family. And so, he, uh, right here, here's another thing. Uh, here's another, uh, okay, right here. Um, so, uh, Sarden, he started out with a, uh, well, he thought, well, what are we going to do? He came out here and he looked at this plant tablet and he came up with this concept. Neither an obelisk nor a rectangular box nor a dome served right on this site or for this purpose. But here, at the edge of the Mississippi River, a great arch did seem right. So this, he had actually started with, uh, uh, with a pipe cleaner. And, uh, and so he just took it out and he just worked on it. And he came up with this idea. And you can see the uh, kind of idea you could get. And here's, a, here's an idea. So he, uh, uh, and so he worked on it and he worked on it. And he worked on it. And so he came up. He had this idea for an arch. But what kind of arch? Well, throughout history, whenever people have uh, invaded another land, they come back and they have a, a, they have a ceremonial arch. But what kind of arch? Well, they didn't quite know. And um, so they, they figured, well, let's see. And they wanted to design it just right. <laughs> and there was one problem. They didn't know. They couldn't figure out the bright size because they didn't have calculus. Anybody here know calculus? OK. Um, but finally, they did figure this out. And they figured out the catenary curve is a wonderful thing. One thing it does, I mean, it's what you do, how you hang a chain. And um, they, he hung a chain, and um, it was, they had, they just used all this calc, man, it sounds, but uh, the only problem that Saren saw it was, this is 2.8. I don't want that. I want it, you see, up there, it's a little bit more graceful than this. How am I going to do this? So uh, he thought about it, he thought about it, he thought about it, and he said, oh, 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 oh. What if, you see, the, uh, he came up with what was called a weighted catenary curve. And by the way, when I, the, the great thing about a catenary curve is all of the weight, all of the pressure, or whatever, goes right down. There's no need for anything right down the structure. But with a catenary curve, there is, you have, um, well, with a weighted catenary curve, basically you have, for each one of these rungs, you have a different weight. In other words, the ones at the top are three times, a little bit more than three times the weight as the ones at the middle. And so that would tend, you see, like actually what it is, it's like, and this is what it is for each side. The, uh, at the bottom is 54 feet on each side. At the top, it's 17 feet on each side. It makes it look uh, more ethereal and lighter and whatever. Uh, and what that does is it basically pushes it out and it makes for a more gentler curve. And that's the curve that causes people who work for years at the art to still, every time they go out, they say, wow, this is amazing. This guy was a, he was trained as a sculptor in Paris. Uh, so he knew this, he spent 14 years doing this uh, until 1961. And unfortunately, he died of a massive brain tumor and he never saw it. 
but um, and that's one of the things about the one of the wonderful things about the Gateway Arch and about things taking so long. It takes as long as it needs to to be right on this thing. And so uh, right here, he said. That. I suspect, however, that a catenary curve with lengths of the chain graded at the same proportions as the arch thins out would come very close to the lines upon which we settled. Can you get that? Basically, if you have these lengths where like a little bit more than three times as big at the top as at the bottom, that's how it looks. And so you have this. And I don't know calculus, but I can concentrate sort of, and I'm a, I'm a dumb Dutchman, and I just uh, think, look at things and look at things. So I looked at math. I looked at this, this right here, something called the Mathematics of the Gateway Arch. This right here is about 10 pages long, and I just looked at everything I could. I just disregarded the, uh, disregarded these equations, and I looked at it, and I looked at it, and I looked at it, and I, it just was amazing. And this is why a thousand years from now, people will be coming to the Gateway Arch to look at this. And I just couldn't figure out, I'm not, I, but fortunately, I couldn't figure out what the math guys would see in all those equations, and with the engineers and with the architects, but I got a Google translation. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, that was truly amazing. Uh, so, he was, I have, uh, we've got 45 minutes worth of stuff. Every, everybody, everybody wants to stay on, don't they? No, no, we'll, we'll, okay, this, this is some of the, some of the pictures of them building it, uh, right here. Uh, uh, of course, when you'll see in some of these things, uh, the people don't, you see, these people aren't being held up by anything. Uh, they thought 13 people would die, and nobody died. Uh, Okay, um, of course, right here. Um, okay, these are three people. These are the Artegas. This is uh, Danny Artega. This is Sun Sun Artega. Uh, they took thousands and thousands of pictures, <laughs> wonderful pictures. Uh, this is the guy, every guy knows, guys know the, uh, that movie you see at the arch. This guy, he was a, uh, he w was uh, an amazing uh, filmmaker. They'll be showing it again a thousand years from now. Uh, you should definitely see that. Uh, this was uh, this was a fellow named Percy Green and a, and a white protester. They were protesting the lack of jobs, and he snuck up there 125 feet, and and so that. A lot of publicity as they should. Uh, okay, right here, some more shots here. Uh, it's bend it over. Right, uh, again, you see the, the picture. That's this is the last piece. Uh, see this guy. See these two guys go back up. Um, and so, um, anyway. Uh, so this right here, oh, right here, I'll just, we have just a little bit more time, right here. This, uh, this is what left, what's, this is what they made the gateway arch of. Uh, type 304 stainless steel, pots and pans, that's it, a uh, quarter of an inch thick. Uh, and so, uh, right here. Uh, not too long ago, they, I mean, several years ago, they were, they noticed there were some splotches going on, they were wondering, is something happened, is there, is this, is something happened to the stainless steel? Uh, and so they got some people out, and they, um, decided, these were people who, on the weekends, they just go up mountains or whatever, uh, 
So this was nothing. Right here, anybody want to do this? Anybody want to do this? Yeah. Okay, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, right here, you see? Uh, if you see in this dark spot, there's somebody. Now, this is your trivia question. On the inside, the two sides on the inside are the intradus. Intradus, because it's in. Uh, on the outside, it's the extradus. So, you, you can show how smart you are. Uh, okay, right here, there's another guy, and you can see these, these things. Uh, oops, one guy, one of the, the guy in charge, he was at, he, he was with his, uh, on his uh, daughter's fifth, 16th birthday. Uh, uh, she called him, he took a call, and he was just hanging out, hanging out, you know, and so he took the call. Uh, so, what they found out, is this is just dirt. I mean, this is dirt and pollution, and they could, of course, they would have to do everything the same. And there are some problems, they're not sure whether they, they, they should do it or whether they should make it develop a patina. Uh, you know, uh, like again, it would have to be done absolutely the same everywhere, or the arch would look terrible. Um, so, with that, like I said, I, I have, Lots more to show, but uh, we'll leave it at that. Uh, but but once again, this is stainless steel, is iron and 18% chromium. I think it's 8% 8, 8 nickel and some other stuff. Uh, so um, that's uh, so that's the thing, and I'll take some questions.